Hey guys, Jay Van Gordon here with SAP Euro and welcome to the 1.8 Turbo Volkswagen Audi Engine Diagnostics Guide. All right, so the 1.8 turbo can be found on many different Volkswagen Audi vehicles. Uh, starting with the Mark IV, it's found in the Golf and the Jetta, as well as the, uh, the new Beetle as well. It actually carried over to the Mark I uh, Audi TT. Um, there's many different power levels, primarily based on which turbo it came with and, and the software tuning, um, with power ranges anywhere from 150 horse all the way up to about 225 horse, uh, which is found as the most powerful version of this motor, uh, and that was on the, uh, the Audi TT 225. In today's video, we're gonna go over many of the different maintenance items you're going to want to replace during uh, ownership of these vehicles or of this engine. Uh, we're going to go over some of the common failure points, things to look out for, and things that just typically wear out over time. All right, so you may notice that we do have some parts on the bench in front of us. Some are new and you may notice that some are used and that's because uh, a lot of the used parts here are from DIYs that we've recently done on the 1.8 Turbo for the community. With that said, we're going to walk over to the car and uh, I'm going to show you what to look out for. All right, so we're over at the car and uh, just to simply put it, I'm gonna go over things from left to right and basically how they're laid out. Um, starting with this brand new coolant level reservoir. Um, so this typically, uh, it's not really that big of a failure item, but what happens is over time, uh, they do get oxidized and discolored. So more so as a cosmetic thing, but uh, you know, they, they can leak at the seams here. So just a general maintenance item again. Uh, moving on from there, obviously the biggest component on the left side of the engine uh, is going to be the time belt. These are to be replaced every 75,000 miles. We do have a video DIY you can check out uh, if you need to replace one on your particular car. When you're doing the engine the timing belt and you're replacing that, you're gonna wanna replace all the components that go along with it. So that means your timing belt itself, obviously. Your hydraulic tensioner, there is a mechanical tensioner. You're gonna wanna replace the serpentine belt, which is your drive belt, and that's what drives all your accessories on the particular engine. Good time to also replace the uh, drive belt tensioner as well, just another three bolts. And also one of the other items that you have to remove to replace the time belt is gonna be the engine mount on the side. So again, like one of those jobs that while you're in there, there's multiple components that you'd love to replace. Not a bad idea. So typically a time belt, uh, let's get into that. So how do you know if a time belt is, you know, has gone bad or is ready to replace? Number one, like I mentioned earlier, every 75,000 miles. Uh, aside from that, if you look at the belt, if you see any type of glazing or stress cracks or any fraying or anything like that, replace your time belt. So it is one of the most critical components on this engine. And the reason being, it basically sinks the top half of the engine to the bottom half. And if that belt was to go bad, uh, basically you're gonna have uh, valve to piston contact and uh, you know catastrophic engine damage pretty much. Uh, you know, that cylinder head would have to come off and uh, you would have to replace some bent valves. Um, now keep in mind, on this particular engine, it's five valves per cylinder, you know, a 20 valve engine. That probably isn't a fun job. And you're gonna have a lot of valves to replace. So general rule of thumb, make sure you stay on top of your time belt. Besides the belt, you also have tensioners. So along with the belt, always gonna wanna replace your time belt tensioners. Actually, if you look at the Volkswagen procedure for this particular engine, um, they do show you how to uh, compress the hydraulic tensioner so you could reuse it. Uh, just a no-brainer, just replace the tensioner. You know, if you go to uh, the FCP Euro catalog, we do have some OE components. It's literally two bolts, and it's much easier to replace. You don't have to compress the piston. Other than the time belt components themselves, uh, something else to look out for. Um, so again, this car, these engines are getting, you know, up there in age. And with that said, you have a lot of different rubber uh, hoses. So for instance, you have, you know, these rubber fuel lines here. It's a quick disconnect on this side, and there's some hose clamps here. But over time, these hoses do dry rot and they can start to leak. So, you know, if you're in there doing the job or even if you pop the hood and just happen to notice it, um, you know, replace those, those hoses as well. All right, in addition to the time belt, uh, I mentioned the drive belt earlier. The same scenario as the timing belt. If you notice any type of cracking, fraying, any type of glazedness, any type of noise coming from the particular belt itself, uh, you can actually get a pretty good visual on it right here, uh, just looking down. So quick way to gauge you know, how old it is or if it's you know, on its way out, just do a visual inspection. One other thing you can look up for is once you're you know, removing the belt or you have it disconnected or off the vehicle, 
not a bad idea to just go through all your accessories, your alternator. Um, you know, if you're not replacing the, the serpentine belt tensioner, go through the, uh, the idler on that tensioner itself. Just spin all the accessories by hand and listen for, listen for any type of bearing noise. You know, that's, it's a good opportunity to, uh, to listen and see if any of the bearings are worn in any of the accessories. Just some other components in the area to be uh, cognizant of. Um, this is your power steering reservoir. Um, so that sits right on top of the engine mount. Now, obviously, if you have any type of leaking coming from that reservoir, good time to replace it. Check out your hoses. If they're leaking, replace it. If they look old or brittle or worn out, tired, replace them. Um, I mentioned the engine mount earlier. That is uh, another uh, component that uh, wears out in this particular engine. They sag over time. So if you notice that you know, like your engine's really sagging pretty bad to one side, um, you know, it, it could be that you need a, a new engine mount as well. Uh, other components in the location, obviously you have your windshield washer reservoir here. This is your main throttle body hose that goes to your throttle body. Um, I have seen from time to time the throttle bodies uh, give out. So pretty easy, four bolts right up top. Moving on to there, we can go over to the valve cover. So the valve cover gasket is also known to leak. Basically it goes around the entire perimeter. Um, not too bad of a job, but while you're in there, there's another uh, gasket that leaks on the backside, um, and that is your timing chain tensioner. So I know we mentioned this, this engine has a belt, uh, and you're gonna notice one pulley up front. So basically, there's two cams and only one pulley that's driven off the timing belt. And that's because, so this pulley drives, uh, it's connected to the camshaft and goes to the back of the engine. And then there's a timing chain that links um, the exhaust camshaft to the intake camshaft. And in between that chain is a chain tensioner naturally, which keeps tension on the chain as the name suggests. And there's a seal underneath the timing chain tensioner. That seal typically gets really hot, crusty. Uh, it will dry out over time and that will leak. So if you notice, uh, you know, any type of, I wanna say a larger oil leak on the backside of the engine, it's probably coming from that seal. So typically uh, it's not a bad idea to replace your valve cover gasket and your, your timing chain tensioner at the same time. All right, so just another quick note on the timing chain tensioner. Um, when you're doing that job, you will need a special tool and we'll link that above. Basically what that tool does is it compresses uh, the chain tensioner, it takes tension off the chain. You're able to move the tensioner out and out of the way to replace that seal. Um, there are some aftermarket and even the, uh, the factory ones, they come plastic. However, we do have a really robust, robust unit from 034 Motorsports. And again, we'll link that uh, up above. Moving on from the valve cover, obviously you're gonna have your ignition and this is kind of like uh, where Volkswagen got pretty notorious for their ignition coils going bad. This is one of their first uh, coil unplug designs. And uh, on these particular engines, they were notorious for the coils going bad. There have been several, multiple revisions, you know, at this point. So what you find now at the retailers and on our site is like the latest revision. Um, they are pretty reliable, um, pretty easy to replace. You know, they just pop right out. There is a connector here. With that said, again, plastic connectors, they, they do get old, they do get brittle over time. So when you're releasing them, you have to be really, really careful. If you have to get in there with a pick to release one of the tabs, not a bad idea, but just, you know, it's one of those Volkswagen classic style connectors where you push in, you press down on the clamp and then you pull back. Problem with that is where you're pushing down on, it's plastic and sometimes they do break. If they do break, not the end of the world, you just have to replace the connector uh, housing itself. But it's additional time, you have to swap the wires out. So a telltale sign of the ignition coil failing, um, misfires. You're gonna get a flashing check engine light. You're gonna lose a ton of power. The car's not gonna be driving well. I probably don't even have to tell you all the symptoms because you're, you're just gonna know <laughs> that you blew a coil or, or maybe even a spark plug that time. You know, if a spark plug play, uh, fails, you're gonna get the same thing. We suggest replacing the ignition coils and spark plugs anywhere between you know, 40 and 60,000 miles, depending on your driving conditions and how you actually drive the car, or if you have any type of modifications, but generally within that range. Moving on to the fuel system. Um, now on the back of the car, obviously you're gonna have uh, a fuel pump, which is an intake pump, which is gonna send pressure up to the fuel rail here. Um, this is your fuel rail that runs across the intake manifold, and you do have injectors. Um, that's kind of like the beauty of, of the 1.8 turbos. This is uh, right before they came out with the FSI engines. Um, so you still do have the multi-port. So you really don't have to worry about too much uh, carbon buildup on the back of the valves. Um, but with that said, it does have some problems in its own. 
they are still fuel injectors, they are still you know, electronically operated so they can fail that way, uh, or the tips or the nozzles can get clogged up as well. So you may not get like a, a good spray pattern and uh, you may not be getting like the best performance out of the injector as well. Another common trait on this particular car, um, so the injectors sit inside of what's called a fuel injector cup. Now the cup is, it's a plastic cup and it threads into the intake manifold. And over time, those plastic cups can also crack and break. Um, so if you're getting any type of like fuel leak um, or even like an air leak, check around those cups. Um, it's very common. There are some aftermarket options out there um, that you know replace the plastic cups with aluminum. Injector cups, uh, typically they fail. Start checking them out anywhere between like 75, 100,000 miles or seven to 10 years plus. I mean, there's no real time limit on when these things are good or when they're bad or when they could fail. Um, just something to be cognizant of. Keep an eye on it. So now moving to the front of the engine. Um, first and foremost, you can't miss it. This bright orange dipstick. Two things, the handle falls off, they crack, and then the two underneath. Uh, very, very common for these to break, uh, especially at this age and, and you know higher miles. As soon as you look at them, they typically just crumble before you even get a chance to touch them. So uh, something else to be uh, to be cognizant of, keep an eye on that. Also, you're gonna notice that um, these hoses here, these are the air pump hoses. Um, they're plastic, they're corrugated, and over time, they don't uh, hold up all that well. So this car has approximately 156, 158,000 miles. Obviously, you can see that these have been replaced at some point. I wanna say anywhere from the general range of 100,000 miles onward, or seven, 10 years onward, they're plastic, keep an eye on them. Speaking of the air pump, uh, there are some other components that do fail in that system as well. So obviously you have these two lines. One runs to the back here. There's the combi valve. That is the valve that basically controls the, the air pump. And then there's also this hose that goes to the air box down to the air pump as well. And then on the air pump, when I put the car back up in the air later, I'm actually gonna show you there's, uh, there's some little mounts on the air pump itself. That's what keeps it fixed into place. They're, they're rubber and uh, those dry rot over time as well. So basically to reiterate in that system, um, the pumps can fail, the mounts of the pumps can fail, the hoses can fail, and then also uh, the combi valve, which is back here. Moving onward, some other common uh, replacement items. We're gonna have basically your PCV hoses. You're gonna notice some of these hoses are nice and fresh up here. Um, again, rubber hoses, they do fail over time. Um, the valve, not so much, not a bad idea to replace the valve itself, uh, but more so the actual hoses. Another component is going to be your diverter valve up here. And this is your turbo boost controller valve or the N75 valve. Those typically fail, a very common replacement item. When the N75 typically fails, you could get some, um, some boost issues, the car not producing enough boost or it's over boosting and throwing the car into limp mode. That's very common. Um, with that, you're also going to get some check engine light, which will probably point you in the right direction of the turbo boost control valve or the N75. Uh, moving on to the right side of the engine, just some other basic components here. You know, you got your air filter, basic tune-up item. Replace your plugs, replace your air filter. Very, very easy. It just pops right out of the place. It's a couple Phillips head screws here. Disconnect, you know, the air pump hose, mass air, flips up. And then you have obviously the battery, which is located here. Battery, pretty simple. Uh, just one other thing to note there. Uh, you could check out our DIY for that. But uh, there's a plate with a bracket that tends to get rusted into place. So if you could free it up, um, that's great. If not, you may need to replace the battery tray. And that's, again, only if it gets rusted. But very simple, everything's right in front of you, very easy to access all these components. So now we've gone over some of the, the maintenance items and some of the mechanical items to look out for. Uh, let's go into one of the other major pain points of this vehicle and this particular engine. Uh, this is gonna be the cooling system of the 1.8 turbo. Um, so there's many different components that fail and things to look out for. Let's start off with the time belt. So basically the time belt also drives the water pump. Now the water pump originally came on this car with a composite impeller. Um, you will notice, especially on our website, a lot of different brands will offer a metal um, impeller. My advice is to stick with that. So what happens with the plastic composite impeller is over time, so think about you know the engine heating, cooling, heating, cooling. What happens with plastic over time, if it's heating and cooling, it gets brittle and it breaks off. So when it happens, you may notice your car start to overheat. Um, so if you're replacing your time belt or have to replace your water pump, I always recommend to stick with a water pump that has a metal impeller.
Moving on from there, another common item uh, is going to be the thermostat. And the thermostat is kind of buried underneath the intake manifold here. Easiest way to get that is, you know, remove these air pump hoses here and there's a plate right up top here. Underneath that plate, there's gonna be a whole hodge of uh, vacuum hoses. And again, anything that's rubber or plastic, over time it gets brittle and it will break. So when you're going to access the thermostat, um, you're gonna have to flip this plate over and there's a really, really good chance that you may break or damage some of these lines if they're not already broken already. Um, we do also sell this particular uh, cluster on our website. So be sure to check that out. We'll put a link above. Other than that, you know, swinging this plate out of the way, removing the dipstick tube and replacing that because you're probably gonna have to. The thermostat is, it's buried. It's just behind the alternator. You can see it, the, probably the hardest part is just getting to some of the bolts on the, uh, the actual coolant flange. So basically, um, this is the flange for the thermostat. Like I said, there's just a two bolt. Uh, this bottom one can be a little bit difficult to get to. We do have a DIY that shows you exactly how to do that. Uh, short and sweet, just use a swivel socket. But again, it's not really that hidden. It's just underneath the in intake manifold and it's in a pretty bad spot. All right, so we talked about the water pump. We talked about the thermostat. Another common item is going to be the flange on the side of the cylinder head here. Um, that is a plastic flange. Volkswagens are notorious for having these plastic flanges on the side of the, the cylinder heads. And what happens over time is either this O-ring will dry out and it'll leak, or the actual plastic will crack and it'll start to leak from there too. In addition to that is another component in the cooling system, which is your engine cooling temperature sensor. And that resides in this flange as well. That is a commonly failed item. And when that fails, you could either A, get a check engine light, or in some extreme cases, you may actually get like your car uh, not starting. Um, and obviously you could get false readings on, you know, the, um, the coolant gauge as well. As far as the sensor goes, that could fail anywhere, you know, early mileage or late mileage, just something to be uh, cognizant of. Um, there have been many revisions on the website. We do have the latest one. Be sure to check that out. Uh, moving on from there, obviously in the cooling system, just inspect all your hoses, uh, make sure there's no leaks. And the other major component that you have is going to be your radiator. All right, so with that set up here, I'm gonna bring you underneath the car now, and I'm gonna show you uh, a few other pain points underneath, and, uh, and actually where the radiator is uh, leaking on this specific car. All right, so now we're underneath the car, and like I mentioned, the, the radiator is leaking, and I just wanna show you where and, and pretty much why that happens. Um, so basically, if you look at a radiator, you're gonna have um, plastic cores on each end, and then there's gonna be the metal core in the center that has all the cooling fins on it, and that's where the coolant flows back and forth. And typically, um, what you're gonna see is basically where the plastic tank meets the, um, the metal core of the radiator. Um, that's where it actually leaks. And you can see, if you zoom in here, if you look on the ends here, you can see this is completely, I mean, it looks like an original radiator. The end tanks where, you know, the crimps are, are completely rusted over. And you can actually see some coolant dripping um, from the area. So not a bad thing to look and inspect. Just get underneath the car, take a look at those, see if there's any coolant dripping. Um, while I'm down here, just something to mention, this is where you would drain the coolant if you were to be working on the cooling system. There's just this little pet cock here. Um, basically, it's a little valve and you just turn it and the coolant drains right out. So you don't have to disconnect the lower hose or anything like that. Other than that, um, you know, you do have your cooling fans. Those typically do fail from time to time. Uh, sometimes you could get a code, other times you just notice that they're in up and maybe the car is overheating. Moving on from there, we're gonna talk about the air pump. I mentioned uh, the air pump earlier. The air pump does reside right over here. Um, so it's right in front of the oil pit. And this is where you can see the hoses that plug right into it. And you're gonna notice uh, the mounts. So basically the air pump mounts to this metal bracket here and it's held in by these um, rubber grommets. And basically the, uh, these mounts will crack over time, such as this one. You can see this one's just about to let go, to be honest. And one's in back, not too far behind. So just a better visual from underneath, you could check that out. Again, power steering pump, always check your lines. Um, if the car, especially if the car doesn't have any type of splash shield underneath, all this stuff is completely exposed to the elements. Um, so you're just asking for trouble there. So always a good uh, idea to check those out. Again, here's a, a better uh, view of the serpentine belt and your accessories. Obviously the power steering is one, you have your crankshaft, you have your AC compressor and your alternator up top. 
All right, so moving on, obviously, one of the other main components down here is going to be your oil pan. Those do typically leak as well. If you are noticing any type of leak, it's gonna be from the perimeter of the oil pan. Um, another thing you can look out for is any type of oil that's leaking from, you know, where the engine and the transmission made together. Um, that could indicate a rear main seal leak as well. If you have a leak underneath your uh, crankshaft pulley, that could indicate that you have a crankshaft seal, a front crank seal leak. Another common oil leak to look out for is basically this is your turbo return line. So this is basically all the oil that's coming from your turbo and it's draining back down into the oil pan. It doesn't so much leak uh, so much from the, from the oil pan itself. You know, there is a gasket here and it's not too, too common, but primarily where this hose leaks is from uh, where the braided or, or crimped end meets the, the metal tube. Again, something else to be wary of, this particular line leaks as well. Also, we didn't mention turbochargers, uh, but they do have oil seals internally. Um, you could have an external leak from, you know, basically where some of the lines may up, but if you have an internal oil leak, basically you're gonna see a lot of oil uh, getting plumbed through your intake piping. So as you're going through the intake piping, if you were to remove um, basically this pipe here or either of these hoses and you get a little bit of oil dripping out. I wanna say a little bit is, is not something to worry too, too much, but if you were to take this off and it's just dumping oil, obviously you have bigger problems. Uh, you might have a, a, a bad oil seal within the turbo. With that said, um, the turbo, this is all the plumbing. So basically it goes from the turbo, uh, it goes to the intercooler here, and then it goes straight up to your throttle body. Last but not least, this is another one of your engine mounts, uh, commonly referred to as the dog bone. Uh, so one end mounts the transmission. You have a bushing here. Again, rubber tends to fail. And then the other one back here, which mates uh, to the back of the, uh, the subframe there. So we do have multiple options available for the dog bones. Be sure to check out our website. Uh, there's, there's many options available there, performance and OE. Um, and with that said, let's head back over to the bench. All right, guys, so that about wraps up the diagnostic guide for the 1.8 turbo engine. Um, yes, I know it was a lot to cover, a lot to digest. I can promise you that these, these engines aren't as bad as I made them out to be. Uh, literally, we're going over everything that goes bad on these particular engines. Uh, so take a look at grain of salt. They're not all gonna fail all at once. And with preventive maintenance, these are items that you could you know, check out beforehand and replace before they actually fail. Uh, so with that said, I hope you liked today's video. If you liked it, make sure you hit that like button. Any comments or questions, comment in the box below, and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.